It was a uh, roaring establishment with a, with a pretty good reputation. A lot of money to start it. And quite a clientele. And these spoons, why do they look the way they do? Well, Mike, they came through a, a terrifically hot fire. I mean, the, the fire enveloped the building in, in several minutes. Two people lost their lives. And uh, by the time it was, it was over, the, the hotel was absolutely leveled. People couldn't get near it. Of course, there was no fire brigade in town. And with the loss of the hotel Fairview, Fairview itself began to slip and slip drastically from then on. Is the fire at the Fairview Hotel and the treasure story related? Yeah, they're inextricably linked that very definitely. We, well, the story of it is rather interesting because I was out with an old friend of mine called Cyril Murray, who was a teacher in Penticton. And this was uh, 1969, 18 years ago. And he was kind of curious about Fairview. Cyril is one of these taciturn Scots who was a very observant man. And so we went down there and looked through the old town site, and there was very little left. There was the old government building, the jail at that time. And, um, but we got up on the hill and looked down on the old town site, and you could see the faint outlines of where the old original buildings had stood, which is kind of an intriguing sort of thing. And Cyril asked me, he said, Bill, do you remember where the, uh, or do you know where the, the big teepee was? And so we knew there'd been a fire at the big teepee. I said, yeah, I think I can find it. So we wandered down through the sagebrush, watching our step, because that, that, that flat is covered with uh, not only sagebrush, but uh, a reasonable number of rattlesnakes in that particular area, especially at that time of the year, mm -hmm. late spring, early summer. And um, so we wandered down through the sagebrush, and we came across the, um, obviously, the site of where the, where the big teepee was. And um, we looked at it and noticed there was an old screen with, with holes about this big in it in the center of, 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 the, uh, of the site. And the site was on a kind of a sandy site, so it was very easy to dig. And Cyril and I got to talking about it, and we thought, perhaps we'd come back and bring back uh, uh, a small mesh screen, a quarter-inch mesh screen and a couple of shovels, and take a look around. So we returned, actually, the next week, and we, we, we went, went back to the original site. And, and it's funny, rather funny, because we'd, we'd, we'd studied some pictures, some original photographs, which were made on glass negatives. And sometimes a glass negative gives what you call a mirror image. That is, it reverses it, like you're looking in a mirror. Yeah. So Cyril had been looking at one of these uh, images, and I'd been looking at the other. And so Cyril said, well, he said, Bill, he said, the saloon door is over there. And I said, no, no, Cyril, I think it's over there. And I pointed to the opposite. Oh, he said, I remember in the picture, he said, I remember quite distinctly. And he said, ah, it was right there. And I said, no, I'm, I'm, I said, mirror image. Ah, Cyril said, he looked around, let's go straight down the middle. So we walked straight down the middle, right over to the edge of the excavation. And you can still see the old boards, the old burnt boards there. Yeah. And in the sand, we started digging, filled up our screen, started shaking it out. We got Victoria Quarters in the first screen. Victoria Quarters. Oh, Queen yeah. Victoria Quarters. Queen Victoria Quarters. Now, would any of these in here be Queen Victoria Quarters? Oh, yes. Quite most of those. Practically all of those are Queen Victoria because the hotel burned in 1902 and the latest coins 1901. So they'd be, they'd be all Queen Victorias or American coins or English coins. There was a mixture, Mike, of three, three different uh, countries there, English, American, and, and Canadian coins. And so, but in this first hour, it was really quite remarkable because what had happened is why we were so lucky. And if we'd gone to that corner or the other corner, we would have missed. And what had happened is when, they, when the fire had swept through the hotel, one of the floors had collapsed. And with the collapsing of the floor, a, a little jewelry box had slid along the floor, hit the wall, and dropped straight down. And so we picked up this, this jewelry box yeah. with a lot of the coins intact and including that diamond ring, which you're, um, there were half a dozen gold coins, or at least uh, gold pieces in there, jewelry of various types. And this was the most valuable piece. That's four or $5,000 diamond ring. And that was right, right from that little jewelry box that slid down and hit the wall and, and burned. And the box, of course, was not left because it had been a wooden box, so all that was left was the hinges and the jewelry that was inside. This is a beautiful ring. Did you ever find out where this ring came from. Actually, we're quite sure it belonged to the, to the young woman who was engaged to Dr. White at that time, and she died in the fire. She was a young school teacher. She was engaged to Dr. White, and uh, uh, he later married uh, one of the Haynes women. And, uh, but he, this was rather interesting because this, this was his first fiance. Now, this brooch didn't survive quite as well, and it obviously it had the claws established for some sort of stones to be in it, but there are no stones in this brooch at all. Yes, it was probably in a ho hotter part of the fire, and, uh, and of course, this is probably nine carat gold, so it wouldn't survive as well as, uh, as uh, you know, as, as yeah. other gold. Now, there are other 
rings here, these wedding bands. Now, I, I don't take my wedding ring off when I go to bed at night. Uh, wh where were these coming from, the same uh, box of, of, of jewelry? Actually, Mike, they, they didn't. They came from three different sections, actually four different sections of the hotel. We assumed that there were four small jewelry boxes in the hotel, and these came out of all, we got six or seven golden diamond rings, and those aren't all of them. These are just uh, part of the, uh, of the treasure we found in Fairview, including that gold coin, which is an English half sovereign. This is, a, and it's, what it would be worth today? Well, it's hard to tell because there's historic value in that coin. The gold value isn't that, isn't that good, but, it's, but uh, they actually, it's hard to put a, a relative value on that because of the, it was found in Fairview and it came out of the, out of the uh, from the old fire site and so on. This was a, a ring, and this helps you, helps to indicate to you just how hot that fire was. Oh, it was incredibly, incredibly hot. And that melted that gold ring, which is probably 10 karat gold. So how much treasure did you find at the old Fairview Hotel? Well, it's hard to put a definite value on it, Mike, but I think when we take in the, the actual intrinsic value and then the historic value, probably around $10,000 worth. $10,000. Yeah. And that's silver coins from three countries? Yeah. Gold coins? Yeah. All sorts of things? And this is a fraction of the treasure. This isn't all of it, but it's, it's some of the better pieces that Cyril and I discovered. It must be fascinating to sift through and see the story come up. For example, what have we got here? What's this? Well, that's a silver silver chain, watch fob. and uh, each, each link is stamped. Individually hallmarked, right. And who would that have belonged to? I mean, is that the kind of thing you can, you can trace back? This must be a very memorable accessory. Mike, most, most men of substance of that era either carried a silver uh, chain or a, or a gold chain. And uh, so it would be a businessman or a promoter coming into the area. Somebody would be forgiven for thinking that these were lead shot that's when you right. just hauled them out. But what is this? Actually, that's silver, and they're silver nuggets. And they were probably, at one time, uh, cufflinks and, uh, and uh, tie. You could see that there was some sort of a jewelry attachment there because it looks like there's some uh, copper or brass coloring yeah, in there. Yeah, at one time, it probably, pr probably fitted on the tie. Can you give me an indication of how you felt. Can you take yourself back to that day with your uh, quarter-inch screed and your shovels? Okay. I mean, what did it feel like? Were well, you? it was kind of funny, Mike, because first of all, we didn't expect to hit treasure within the first two minutes, and, <laughs> you know, which we essentially did. And this was a Saturday, and so we, uh, in the first couple of hours, before the sun started beating down on us unmercilessly, yeah. and, uh, and uh, we, uh, we, we covered around four thousand dollars worth, and we thought, my heavens, this is an awful easy way to, uh, to, to you know, to, to recover treasure. And so then, what we did is we went back. We realized that probably we wouldn't get a long time there, so we went back before school. Cyril and I would get up about five o'clock in the morning and leave Summerland at about five thirty, go down to Fairview, and work for about an hour and a half, then get cleaned up, and just get back into the classroom before class started. And we would recover something virtually every trip. And the, the interesting thing was, some of the people from the area began to wonder what we were doing, and of course we didn't want to give it away, so we had to kind of uh, lead them astray slightly, and so we had a couple of old bottles propped up, which were all burned and beaten, and, and they said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, we're looking for bottles, which of course we weren't, but if we had tipped them off, of course, we would have been overrun. And uh, and that's eventually what happened. We, we probably uh, stayed in there for three or four months off and on, probably went down there 12 or 15 different times, and each time we'd recover a little bit or a lot. Now, if we hit, if we hit one of the little strong boxes or jewelry boxes that came down the stairs, then, then we, we, we hit a lot. Like that one was of, like a mother load That's right, right. And, we, and you never knew when to expect it because the ground was very, very easy to screen. It was sand. And we knew that two people had lost their lives in the fire, including the manager of the hotel, a man called Matthias. And he had escaped the fire and then had gone back for something. Now, either he went back for gold coins or he went back for paper currency. And we don't know which because both were used at the time. Mm -hmm. And we didn't find many gold coins. So if he went back for gold coins, he did not get out the second time. Mm -hmm. I found his false tooth, in fact, on the, uh, and somewhere uh -huh. in the collection. Yes, it is slightly. There some uh, cowboy must have been staying at the uh, at the hotel because we have a, a couple of uh, what do you call it, ferals? Well, these are actually these are actually rowels. Rowels. Yeah, part of the spur apparatus. They belong on the boot. And this guy was in such a hurry to get out, he left his boots behind and obviously his belt because the belt buckles there. 
So um, he uh, he left in a, in, in, a, in a big hurry, as most of the people in the hotel did. I would guess so. And the tragic story of the young lady whose diamond ring waits for her still. That's right. That's really remarkable. And she's buried up in that old, uh, the old cemetery way up above Fairview Town Site itself. Not much left in the cemetery, Mike, but as near as we can tell, around 36 people were interred there. And um, old, old Mr. Simpson down in Oliver did that, uh, did the research on that. He was a, a man that I knew quite well. How important is a cemetery site to someone like yourself who's writing up stories and history? How, how does a cemetery site help you? Well, it does if the headstones are still there, Mike, mm -hmm. but often they aren't. And so it makes it rather difficult. So you can go, you can, you can sometimes get the records through the provincial government and uh, other records, but it does help if, if the headstones are still intact and the, and the names on the headstones are legible. Now, doesn't a cemetery have to be registered either with the church or with the government at this stage, or, or we weren't, hadn't we reached that stage of sophistication by then? Yes, it would have, have to, ha had to have been registered and, and the deaths and so on under, under special statistics, but, but nevertheless, it's still difficult to know exactly how many people were buried in Fairview. Remember that Fairview lasted from the, from the early 1890s, especially the late 1890s, and by about 1902, after the burning of the hotel, it started to slip, Mike. And then by 1906, it was definitely on the decline. We have a couple of photographs that we can look at last. There is still the uh, jail around, only this jail is no longer on the site. Where's the jail now? Okay, the jail now, well, I think for, for safekeeping, was taken from, first it was on original site in, in, in Fairview, and then it was moved up to the site we see pictured here, and it was there for many years. But it began to receive rather poor treatment, and they were afraid, the, some of the historians locally were afraid that it would, it would disappear, either through vandalism or through fire. And so they took the jail and moved it down next to the museum in Oliver, and that's, it's debatable. And it loses some of its mood when it comes out of the original area, but at least it's safe. Who was incarcerated there, do you know? No, but there, there, there were several murders in, 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 uh, in Fairview, and of course many misdemeanors. Mostly drunks uh, spent yeah. their time in, in the jail in, in, uh, in Fairview. And when we take a look at the town site, c can you relate this town site to me in any way? Well, the, the original town site is, is, uh, is, is rather obvious here. You can see Reed Creek Gulch way up the, uh, the end of the... Uh, uh, towards the end of the picture, the background of the picture. Is that off to the right? And that's, that's off, well, to the, to the kind of the left-hand side. Uh -huh. And uh, all you can see now in Fairview is the signs of the old town. If you were to get up on the side hill and look down, occasionally you can see these fade outlines that are disappearing year by year, Mike, yeah. so that there is very little left in Fairview. So anybody wants to go with this quarter-inch screen there, uh, there's not going to be much left because I would imagine quite a few people attended this site after the story of your treasure came out. Oh, yes. It was gone over extremely well by a legion of individuals who were rather fascinated. All right. Where are we going to go next time? I think next week we'll probably move into a different part of the country. We'll go down to old Yale, which was the, the great gold town on the Fraser River for many years, the metropolis of the Fraser. Not only was it a gold town in its own right, but it was a transportation center. Everybody who went to the Caribou had to go through there virtually. That's right. All right. Yale is where we go next time when you join us for Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. We'll see you then.